Hey, Aliupa. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm really happy to see all of you here. And I'm really happy that you're all interested in AI and want to know what is it really? So um, I'd like to start by um, thanking our sponsors. So uh, we're sponsored by the Royal Academy of Science, by Uppsala Universität, um, by Stockholm University, Umeå University, Chalmers University, Linnea University, and MIT University. So uh, very grateful for their support. And I'd also like to thank our panelists who are joining us. Um, Stephanie from Zalanto and the Art Design Institute, and Benny from Uppsala Universität, and Magnus, uh, um, sorry, Adrian Magnusson from Riksdagen, and Kathleen from Kotiho. Uh, so, um, and I'm your moderator. Uh, my name's Julie, and I'm joining you from Chalmers, and also as a member of the Swedish National Committee for Mathematics. Um, all right, so take it away and here you go. Test, test, hello. Okay, I think it should be okay. Um, no, Julie, thank you so much for uh, the introductions and for inviting me. Um, my name is Stephanie Amari Sereno. I go by she, her. Some context to who I am. I am a first generation US American, a uh, Panamanian American. And I actually live in Berlin, Germany, not in Sweden. <laughs> um, and I am a designer. So my designerly context is that I'm a product designer, interaction designer, and I'm also a design educator. And I teach at various universities in the US and also throughout Germany. And I'm also a product designer at a company called Zalando. Maybe some of you have heard of it before. So um, before I start, I wanted to ground my mission uh, when talking about AI, I want to also just bring it back to my own value, where I personally believe that technology in our digital everyday quotidian should be and must be imagined and created by individuals, artists, designers, writers, citizens. And this should be done in collaboration with others, both humans and non-humans. And non-humans this, in this context is AI. And I do this throughout various ways. But I want to plant three seedlings for you today that I actively tend to and care to in my work as a designer. Um, the first being how I design education, the future interactions with students, designing curriculum. The purple being how I design community and also how I design interactions in an applied sense. And I want to drive home through this yellow bit uh, with the education part that the design education practice that I operate in, number one, uses technology and two goes beyond what we know as visuals and graphics of the designer. That's the aesthetic component is super important to me uh, and the work we do as a designer, which we all know, but I see technology as the material for how we understand how we as humans interact and how we use it in the world. And so maybe a good presentation or a good project to sort of ground that idea of how I use media design. Uh, today is this concept of called animistic collaborators in mixed reality, which is from a design research group that I was in from, with Professor Philip Van Allen, where we were exploring how virtual AI collaborators could work with people in augmented reality. And this was more of a vision for a cooperative direction for, for design, where AI collaborators could participate with us and actually make and create in the design process. And so this prototype sketch that you see on the screen starts to visualize what an AI collaborator could look like if they were floating at your fingertips, always there to give you recommendations. And this prototype was a way for us to explore these more quieter moments with AI collaborators at our hands, giving us recommendations, where the recommendations are not necessarily just things to buy, but more tools for inspiration. In the same design research group, there was another project that came about where we were thinking actively about prototyping. My friend and collaborator, Gadiva Reisenbichler, she asked the question, how might AI in mixed reality extend the practice of exploratory sketching in our design work? And in product design, I don't know if anyone here is a designer, we 
Use exploratory sketching as a form finding and idea molding exercise. It's a way that designers move through ideas quickly and result in more divergent thinking than if we were to start in a software like CAD or um, Figma. And so what I love about this is that this was done a few years ago before the boom of generative AI, but it was essentially this design study to think about how AI can collaborate with us and generate ideas with us. I also teach basic web design and AI explorations to young designers. Here was a web design experiment with Katie Hoy, one of my students, where she was actively thinking, what happens if AIs gossip with each other online? And while this idea sounds crazy, just um, a few months ago, April 2023, um, this article was published uh, from a scientific study, Generative Agents, Interactive Simulacra of Human Behavior. And in this article, they simulated with multiple AI agents how they work and hang out with each other, and they gossiped. They gossiped about political parties, and they also shared news about parties, like actual parties that were being planned. And so I love this because it shows the same concept being tackled from the design side as well as also from a scientific side. Um, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, to kind of get to the next tier of my work, I design community as well. And one of the things I do with designing community is because I want others to engage with these topics, not just through education work, but sort of outside this realm. Not all of us are students anymore. And at work, I work with my friend Hagop Dippel, who's an applied scientist, and we decided to do a talk on the logistics domain that we're in. We were responding to a French news article that looked at how a single package in Europe uh, was going through this crazy return cycle. And the French news article had said that it was ridiculous for the sustainable footprint. And we responded by breaking down what were the AI technology doing with response to returns and how this could be a teachable moment to understand logistics. Um, that talk inspired both of us because we wanted to stay away from the generalities of AI and explain things beyond news headlines. And we actually started a club at Zalando. So the applied science community at Zalando with the product design community, they meet monthly. Um, so me and Hackup, we, we lead this. And we have topics from people within our company to talk about generative AI, to talk about bigger concepts of human trust uh, regarding advice from an AI, from a human, talking about this kind of more like subtopics of automation just with chatbots and also thinking about more trendy topics like LLMs um, and all of this going throughout the whole business units of Zalando. And the last thing I want to say is that all of those things I mentioned, whether they're far reaching in the future scape, future scape or also just community building, they also apply to the work that I do every day at Zalando, which is within B2B logistics. And so while things are very future, future reaching, um, every day I actually think about automation recommendations and design features with the engineers and applied scientists. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> So I'll ask you to please um, hold your questions for our individual panelists until they've each introduced themselves. And then there will be plenty of time for your questions and discussion. Sorry, some technical issues here. <clears throat> Let's see, I think I have to do that. Let's see, pause that. Okay, so um, let me start a little bit about myself. So I am Benny Avelin. Uh, this is sort of my story uh, in some sense. So I started in Umeå, uh, I did my master's uh, or master's in philosophy, so it was something different before the master's came. Um, and then I started my PhD in Umeå actually, and then uh, my supervisor moved to Uppsala, where I finished my PhD, and then uh, this was in uh, 2013, and the topic was partial differential equations. And then I did a postdoc stint in, in Finland. Uh, I have, a, since being there, I have a strong love for, for Finland as well. Very, uh, very interesting country, very similar to Sweden in many ways. 
Um, but then uh, after this, I came back. Um, actually, did uh, one year again in Uppsala, and then I stopped from the academic world and I uh, went into a consulting company uh, called Combient, which is like a collaboration between, uh, you know, it's a Wallenberg Foundation type collaboration. So it's basically working with data science for a year. And then I thought that actually there's so many different questions that we, uh, you know, tools and things that we don't understand that I wanted to actually go back and do some research about AI. So I switched my topic uh, and then I bifurcated. So I stayed actually at this company for some percent. And then I went back to Uppsala, which, uh, where I've been since then. Um, so I basically work jointly in industry as well as, um, yeah, at the university doing research. So what I'm going to sort of outline a little bit today is um, sort of the basics, the sort of what you see all these very fancy things about AI, but what is really AI uh, if you really scale it down to the simplest possible, you know, atomic problem. And then uh, when you scale up a little bit and see, you know, how the same ideas apply if you go and make it a bit more difficult or a bit more complicated, and then uh, address a little bit about the um, sort of challenges that we have uh, to understand AI from a mathematical perspective. So let me just explain a little bit of brief history. So AI has been a field that has existed for quite a long time. So the, the, the sort of hype of AI has come in several different, you know, uh, peaks. And uh, in the 80s, it was mostly about the sort of symbolic idea. So the idea was that you manipulate symbols, which should be like uh, abstract concepts, like a car, uh, that, should, that is like a concept that you should manipulate. And the idea was that the computer would manipulate uh, these concepts itself and try to figure out something and come up with uh, new things. So, and this one wasn't very, uh, I wouldn't say it was very su successful, so it sort of went into hiding. Uh, and then the other side of the story, which is sort of the connectionist idea, which is more uh, like how the brain works. So the, the interesting thing about intelligence should sort of come from the fact that you have uh, a lot of different, very simple connections and this large scale system should somehow give rise to some interesting complex phenomena. Uh, like you can think of swallows flying. So if you look at them, they move in really beautiful patterns, but each swallow just follows the swallow sort of next to it and follows very simple rules, but the sort of collective system moves in a very complicated fashion. So that's the idea. And uh, when you have this connectionist idea, um, the idea is to learn from past examples. So you, you, you show the computer or you show the algorithm, whatever you want to call it, how you should do something, and then it tries to figure out patterns that allows it to solve the same problem. So basically, this is the, uh, the structure that we usually talk about. So a generator is just something that generates situations. So it could be the camera in a car or something like that. And then you have a supervisor which tells uh, something about the image or something about the text or so, something like that. So if you think about chatbots, it would be what is the next word? Like what's a reasonable next word in this sentence? Um, and then you take this as input and then the idea of the learning machine is to figure out some patterns and make a guess for mimicking the supervisor, basically. So it's exactly how you learn to speak, let's say as a kid, right? So you listen to your parents, you try to mimic what they're doing, uh, but they can't really tell you how to you know, build the language model in their head. They just have to figure out, like, oh, this word probably comes after this word. This word means something, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the idea, um, the connectionist idea. And this is the one that is basically the, the main uh, AI boom at the moment. So this is on the connectionist side. OK, so let's take a super simple example. So here we have x corresponds to the x-coordinate. This is the generator, right? And y is a label. So this is so some supervisor provides the value of y. And the goal is to find the relationship between these two, the input and the output, right? So this would be uh, ridiculously simple because you could essentially see that oh, I should draw a line, right? Uh, but the goal is to find a, a function that takes the, uh, the x and gives you the y. So it would be 
try to find a straight line. So how do you solve a problem like this? Well, it goes in a few different steps. So the first step is to choose um, what, you know, what class of functions should I search from, right? So the simplest would be, we know already that it should be a straight line, so why not take the equation for the straight line? Um, but if you have the equation for the straight line, you have a slope and you have the intercept, so moving it up and down. So you don't know these, so you have to use the data or the, these observations to figure out what the values should be. And usually this goes by minimizing some error, right? So this is the true value, this is the prediction, and then you just measure the difference between the, the truth and the prediction, and they try to find the best slope and the best intercept. And then once you've done that, you have, you know, the model has learned something, right? Um, so then the, the learned model would be this straight line here, which incidentally is now the, the best fitting line to the data. Okay, so this might seem very uh, simplistic and uh, you know we've done uh, linear regression for many many years this was uh, you know even before computers uh, you can do it by hand but the concepts are the same right it's just the fact that now the x is something really really uh, complicated and the y usually isn't all that complicated even though it can be uh, so let me take an example of a more complicated problem so this is the problem, is essentially is one of the problems that a self-driving car has to solve. So here, the X is the input, right? So it's just some camera on some, someone driving or walking or whatever. And the goal is to identify what's in the image, right? So if you have a bike, maybe you wanna avoid the bike. That would be a good thing. Um, and then the supervisor would be someone that just draws, uh, you know, boxes around the things in the image. So here you have a bicycle, there you have a car, and, you know, a truck over there. And the goal is to take X as the input and spit out the boxes. So you have to find a function again, right? It's just that this function is really complicated. Um, and because if you think about, you know, an image like this, uh, it has roughly a millions of pixels, right? Um, so if you uh, try to visualize this, it will be quite difficult as a straight line example. So it will not be that. So you need something more complicated than a straight line. And this is exactly what the idea of neural networks is supposed to solve. Um, so this is usually the picture people choose uh, for neural networks. And each one of these nodes are called neurons. And they're supposed to be like, or at least the, um, the origin was that these are models for neurons in a brain, but it's not really anywhere close to how the brain works. But it still does something really remarkable these days. Um, so this one, each one of these, uh, you know, neurons has a bunch of uh, parameters or knobs that you can turn. And then when you turn them, you change the, the, the way the output performs. So then the goal is just to find these parameters to solve the problem. But uh, the issue is that you can have many million parameters, uh, like many million, uh, 200, 300 million parameters. Uh, so in order to actually find these, uh, you know, the, small, the best parameters, that's actually a very difficult problem computationally. And uh, it's using uh, graphic cards to do these computations. Um, and this is why, this is the reason why it's so, uh, you know, expensive in terms of electricity to train a neural network because it's so difficult to figure out what is the right parameters and how to twist them to make things work in the way that you want them to do. Um, and this one is the simplest neural network and uh, most of the research on neural networks is sort of how to change the shape of this one to solve certain problems. And uh, whenever you figure out the shape that is really good for a certain type of problem, there's a certain breakthrough, which is, for instance, in ChatGPT, which is a certain type of transformer network. Um, but that was basically the shape that gave, gave rise to the fact that they could solve certain problems. Um, but the problem is we don't really understand how the shape affects things. It's sort of like a trial and error search thing. Um, so just you know, to give you a hint as to why it's difficult to find the smallest value, 
So let's say you're in, uh, you know, in Visby, you're walking on the streets, you want to go down to the, you know, the ocean. And then you're like, oh, which should I, should I go in, in the direction in every crossing that's going down? If I do that, maybe I get stuck somewhere, I have to go a bit up. And you're like, oh, that's, that's too bad. I use too much energy. So you have to find sort of the best way to go to, to uh, you know, reduce the amount of energy that you go down. And by energy, you can equate it to electricity if you want. But now, this is one dimensional problem. And this one has million dimensions. So you have a million different directions to choose to go from. You know, which one do you choose? It's a very difficult problem. Um, so that is uh, an active area of research. It's uh, my area of research. And the other problems that can occur uh, is basically how do we choose? If we choose the wrong uh, type of network, we can end up with uh, different types of problems. Uh, the first problem is what is called overfitting. Um, basically, it would mean that you have exactly learned the data, right? So you just, you know, you find a curve that passes through every every dot. You know, you minimize, you have zero error. You can perfectly perfectly uh, adapt to the data, but if you have a new observation, it might not be as good as it looks on the, on the training set. But this is actually not a too bad overfit. It's called benign overfitting. Um, the other one is when uh, you find a function that sort of passes through the points, but sometimes goes way off, right? So if you make, it seems to do pretty well on this data, but if you change this one a little bit, your prediction's gonna be way off, right? Um, and this can have impacts uh, if you are thinking about safety uh, of systems, right? So if you change something tiny bit, let's say you're, you're trying to detect where the road is, if you're driving a car and then suddenly it thinks there's like a wall in front of you or maybe, you know, something like that, just because the, the light of the sun came from the wrong angle or something so that you ended up in this region. So it's uh, basically, these are the two uh, problems that I also work on. So the first one was optimization, and then these two. When and why do we actually get this overfitting problem, and when and why is the network unstable? Yeah, so uh, thank you. So while Benny opens my slides, I already say hi. So I'm Kathleen. I'm an, um, also a mathematician like Benny, uh, slightly different type of math, but we care about the same problems. And, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I need more technical help. So then I'm a mathematician, not an IT expert. But, uh, so I'm an assistant professor at KTH, where I'm also a docent, so I teach mathematics and I do research in mathematics, and uh, there are slides yeah. in a second or so. You have to. Okay. And then it should be the first slide here for Bella. Yes. So I also have a map. <laughs> so I am German, I'm coming from a tiny village pretty close to Sweden. Then I did two bachelor's and two master's degrees, one in mathematics and one in computer science. So I, I, should, I should be able also to be an IT expert. So, but in any case, after I did uh, also study computer science, I actually left it behind for a while and did my PhD in pure math, nothing to do with computer science. That was in 2018. And then I've traveled a little bit to the US, Brown University, where I was a postdoctoral researcher. Then I was a postdoctoral researcher in Oslo and then um, now I'm at KTH, where I'm an assistant professor and lead a group since 2019. So what do I do now? Okay, so the title of my research group is this, Nonlinear Algebra in Data Science and AI. So uh, my group consists of four to seven people, depending on how you count it. So now I have two researchers in my group permanently and then two students where I'm the main advisor, and then three students where I'm like co-advising. And so we all kind of do this sort of title. So I'm seeing a little bit more what we do. 
And so I'm a mathematician, as like Benny, as I said, but I do work together with machine learning researchers. So for instance, I have this collaborative grant, also funded by the Wallenberg that Foundation, we already heard, which is together with computer vision and machine learning researchers, so I do actively interact with them. Exactly, and I got a prize for this interactive research just this year, which is maybe why I'm here. Okay, so I have a slightly broader view on what is AI. It's not just, I think, machine learning. And it's actually a super broad topic, also, of course, psychology, because we should define what is AI and so on. But even from the technological perspective, AI is pretty broad, yeah? Because sort of the goal is to uh, create uh, maybe systems or machines that are human-like or have other type of intelligence. And you need, for instance, robotics for that, right? So this is something that I do not work on at all. Then this is what Benny talked about. Uh, can, we, can machines learn? And there's also this important part, which is related, of course, when we think about self-driving cars and the examples Benny showed, uh, can computers understand pictures as we do? Yeah? Because, I mean, we walk, uh, and then I see a bike, and for instance, I understand that the bike is a 3D object, right? My brain understands this. Like, even if I just see the bike, I kind of can estimate the size of it and so on. And so how can computers do that? So specifically, what we are caring about in my research group is these two bubbles on the, right, the middle one and the right one. So we also do research on the theory of machine learning with these neural networks. And this big question, why do they work? Because the title of this panel is no one knows. Uh, people claim they know, they lie. Pretty sure about it. And then we also do, uh, work on this 3D reconstruction, like the example with the bike. And here I want to claim it's not that all of artificial intelligence is a mystery. I mean, many things in artificial intelligence we do understand. Okay, this is difficult. We do not really have a good uh, feeling. But this, for instance, we do understand pretty well. And it's not a mystery why we can do 3D reconstruction, because our eyes, we have two eyes, so we can see depth and do 3D reconstruction. So I'm not going to dive into this a lot. I just want to, the main point is to tell you that we do know how it works. You know, you can take pictures with cameras, with a selfie stick of the statue, and you can compute a 3D model of the statue. Yeah, and it's not, this is not a mystery or like magic or something. And there is a, an algorithm that's pretty standard. And so this yellow sentence is important. It can be solved with classical algorithms, which, which I mean non-machine learning algorithms. Now, this technology works since the 80s and since the 90s very efficiently. Yeah? Now it has become more efficient, of course. You can like make a 3D model of Rome in one day. Yeah, there was like a paper 10 days, years ago with that title. Can you build Rome in one day? And the answer is yes, with this uh, algorithm. And it's not machine learning. OK. So now then this big mystery is, so when you ask, when people ask this question, why does AI work? I think they mainly mean this question. Why actually does machine learning work? And that's like what Benny said. Uh, these are like many, many thousands or millions even of neurons, and you need a lot of data, which is different from kids, yeah? So Benny brought up this example of kids learning, and also Stephanie did. But a kid, you need to show a kid three examples of a cat, and it will know what a cat is, right? So here you need to show it thousands or hundreds of thousands of pictures of a cat until the pretty reliable can say, this is a cat, right? So there is some major differences, I think, that we still have and we do not know. And also the brain, our brain is much more efficient. Like if you would calculate how much electricity we need to learn what a cat is, I think there's calculations about 30 to 50 watts. But this needs like a lot to learn what a cat is, right? So it's actually, we are better in that sense. Better good for the environment <laughs> at the moment at least. Right, and so the goal is to sort of find the best setup for each of these neurons, but there are super, super many, and then the output is some function that is claimed to best understand the setup. It's the best function to identify cats or the best function to drive a car. But what that means is not clear, right? As Benny said, like you have to walk downwards towards the water, but it's not clear how to, how to do it. And so I want another thing which I want to stress, we have all these mathematical difficulties that Benny uh, highlighted. These functions are very complicated and sort of a lot of mathematical research in the last hundreds of years, it was on a very controlled type of functions. You know? So these functions are so complicated, we haven't really thought about them. 
We have thought about easier functions and proved cool theorems about it because we can. But now we stand here and we have to deal with these functions, but we don't have a lot of math theory to build upon. Yeah? And it's like these millions of parameters you have to find. So that's sort of the, the math problem. And I also want to bring up, I think there's another, pro I didn't know what to call it. I call it now a development type of challenge, which is that it's a super fast growing field. I mean, since its uh, success, like 10, 15 years ago, on this classification problem, is this a cat, yes or no? It has just gone like crazy. There is so much investment into a technology, which is great, by academia and by industry, that uh, the theory people like me and Benny, we just cannot, you cannot even read all the papers that are written, right? It's impossible. And it's like a trend, it's like fashion. I think of machine learning research now, it's like fashion. It's a trend every year. Like 2019, everybody talked about disentanglement. We need to disentangle the data, we need to understand what this word means, and we have to prove theorems about it. If you go to a machine learning conference and say disentanglement, you're outdated. You should not say this word, okay? Now you should talk about attention networks or about nerves, right? So it's a very fashionable field. And then I'm a little bit mean here to ask, but like we mathematicians, I think we are curious, skeptical, and hence a little bit slow, you know? So we're looking there and like, yeah. So this is sort of also a problem, which is why we are where we are. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Okay, now. <laughs> Yeah, I have no slides. I don't work that way. <laughs> uh, so maybe we should close it down, yeah. Yeah, that was easy. Yeah, good. Uh, my name is uh, Orga Magnusson. Uh, I am a member of parliament from the, for the Social Democratic Party. Uh, I am uh, a lawyer by profession, not a mathematician. So I feel like the odd one out, but that's probably all right. Uh, it's good. Uh, I'm from the southern part of Sweden, from Eston, close to Denmark. I hope that you understand what I say, even though I'm almost from Denmark. Uh, some of my colleagues in Stockholm don't, and they uh, like to tell me that. But uh, <laughs> you understand, that's good. Uh, I am uh, chairman of the uh, parliamentary group's uh, digital digitalization committee, and that's why I'm here. Uh, and how did I get into AI? Well. I was, uh, I'm now a member of the Labour Committee uh, in the Parliament, but originally I was a member of the Transport Committee or the Infrastructure Committee. And uh, they asked me, could you be responsible for the questions concerning digitalization? And I said, yeah, of course, broadband and those kind of things, that'll be fun. I can spend my time meeting local politicians, speaking about broadband issues. And then suddenly Chat GPT uh, showed up and then everything changed, you could say. Uh, so now I spend most of my time talking about AI and uh, thinking about AI and what that will do to society and uh, how politics will need to adapt to this sort of um, uh, revolution, you could almost say. And I think that politics hasn't really thought about these issues uh, quite long. There is a uh, a directive that is being discussed in the European Union. I'm sure you all know that, the AI uh, Act Directive. Uh, and um, that, of course, is something that is being discussed also in the Swedish Parliament. How should we regulate AI? Should we regulate AI? And uh, what should we use it for? But I think the politics is still a couple of steps behind. I think that uh, engineers and academia is much further ahead than we are. We haven't fully understood the implications of AI, and uh, I think we are still trying to learn. Yesterday the week, I I wrote a memo to the to the group uh, leaders, what you say in in the parliamentary uh, social the parliamentary group of the Social Democratic Party, and uh, we had a pretty good discussion. But I think we're still on that on that note uh, to sort of figure out what AI is and what to do with it. But I think that we are moving in a direction where we are discussing AI more and more. So, I mean, it isn't, isn't a hopeless case. Uh, I think more and more people understand that this will have a lot of impact on labor markets, for example, and also on um, education systems, probably, and uh, a lot of other things. I, uh, where I come from, the southern part of Sweden, I have noticed that um, agriculture is using AI more and more. 
And that's also something that I didn't know a thing about a couple of uh, weeks ago, months ago. But now I feel like I have at least some, some knowledge uh, of it. Um, I don't think that politicians need to know all the technical details of AI. Of course, it's fun if they want to and they try to learn. But I think that the most important thing is that we try to think about how AI should be used. What is, what is, good, what, what is good use of AI and what is bad use of AI? There are these sort of integrity issues that I'm sure you all know about too. We need to discuss those kind of issues. And I think that that is where the political discussion uh, should be. And I think it is moving in that direction uh, slowly but steadily. And I think that's, that's a good thing. Um, as a social democrat, we, I of course think about uh, mostly uh, how this will affect uh, workers. Uh, I think that is my main concern. And can it be used to strengthen workers' positions? Uh, can it be used to uh, make workers more influent in workplaces? Or can it be used to, or will it be used to make workers less influent in workplaces? Will there be more uh, supervision by AI? I mean as was noticed with the cameras and such, will that be used to... Um, I lost the uh, other volcano. Surveillance. Surveil, thanks. Surveil yeah. the, the workers. And there's those, those kind of things that we need to think about all the time. And I spend a lot of time thinking about this. And what will happen with the surplus that will be... Uh, that will come from uh, automatization and more use of AI in, uh, in workplaces. So uh, I think that's kind of the politics about it right now, but I'm sure if we meet six months from now or a year from now, we will have another discussion where politics is uh, then. But I think this is, this is the current platform where most politicians are. I hope so, otherwise I'm far behind. I hope not I am. So that's that for me. No, no, I'll, I'll stand over there. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about our panelists and a little bit about AI, I'd like to open up for your questions. And if anybody feels more comfortable asking in Swedish, we can tr all translate. So. Yes. Yes, my, can you hear me? Yes. My question is about AI that is trained on copyrighted material. Mm -hmm. What do you see in that discussion? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I can say a technical answer to this question. <laughs> and and the, the issue is basically that of, of privacy. So if you train a very large network, uh, on many images, you can essentially extract some of the things it has learned, right? So it basically contains some of the copyrighted material. So, I, I mean, this probably should be part of the discussion, uh, but it's also important when it comes to like medical data and stuff like that, right? So if you want to release the model, are you actually releasing personal information? So an ov overfit AI model would actually um, replicate media, right? If do, if do I understand that right? If it's overfit, then it would actually have the same image that it was used as data. Yeah, you can essentially extract. Yeah, you can. Uh, most of it, it's not really 100%, but it's, it, yeah, some you can really reconstruct exactly. Yeah. Adrian, do you have anything to add with your legal background in mind? I was I, I was, I was tax lawyer, so I didn't uh, do that a lot. Uh, but um, I actually talked to Lauren Reda, who is a group leader in the culture committee in uh, our party in, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And when I mentioned AI, this was the first thing she, uh, she mentioned, that this will, of course, change uh, the culture sector, uh, what you, how you uh, translate it into English. So it's, uh, it's a, in a lot of politicians' mind, too, I think, this, these issues. But, well, as, uh, as it often is with new issues, it's, there's no good answers, I think, uh, yet. But hopefully they will come. Our second question. 
price, Stefan Trevay. Uh, I want to make a comment. I mean, you had in your slide the, you know, the old-fashioned rule-based AI systems, and then we moved to machine learning-based. And I think, honestly, that many or most practical systems we build will be a combination of rule-based and, and machine learning-based. So machine learning-based doing perception and language and other things, but, but there's also rules. And it's great that you have a politician on the panel because our legal system is one of an extremely good example of a rule-based system. So if you take self-driving cars, you know, we need machine learning to make them understand what's a bike and a car and so on. But then you need a rule-based system to know that you're not allowed to turn right on the red sign if you're in Sweden, but in the US you are. So I think it's important to acknowledge and for you politicians to understand that uh, that these systems will actually be guided by decisions you make as you make new laws and so on. So, so I think you have a good opportunity here to educate your peers on, on those aspects. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> good. <laughs> because people tend to simplify and say that everything is, is machine learning these days. I, I just wanted to chime in that I think this is a really interesting like, uh, like way to think about AI, like the different scales. And I thought your presentation was really good, rule-based, um, pattern making, and then of course, um, you know, everything we're talking about today and what the future holds. But this rule-based system, you know, sometimes I think it's a good question to ask ourselves, how much do we want to automate and make like fully AI? And how much do we kind of want to scale back? And I was talking to a few applied scientists at my company, and the the answer is not everything needs to be fully automated. So things can rely on this sort of first layer of AI, which is this rule-based system. And I think this is an important thing to, to realize that we can go up and down the scale when we uh, think about our systems and our products and also just the way we live our life with AI. Torsten Ragmason, Högskolan i Halmstad or Halmstad University. Um, thinking about the topic of the, of the, the seminar, I actually have three, three questions, which I, I I would be interested in hearing what you think about them. So, so one is, what's the difference between intelligence and artificial intelligence? Um, the second thing is, what does it mean to understand AI? I mean, nobody understands it, so of course we should understand what we mean by understanding AI, if we can say that. Um, and then the third one is, we're seeing AI do things that kind of amazes us. What does that say about us? So as a mathematician, I think we can only very well under, ask, answer the second type of question. What does it mean to understand? So somehow the big difference when I saw it in my talk or classical algorithms, which I mean like non-machine learning algorithms, is that we have theory that says, for instance, if you run this algorithm on this input, then you will get something out and with the probability of 99.89%, uh, the output has these good qualities that you want. Okay? And the problem, for instance, or like one of the major issues with AI and why people talk of explainable AI or reliable AI is that for this machine learning, we do not have that in any way. So the only thing that what happens at the moment for instance, uh, with this example that Benny had, you want to identify objects on pictures so you can, uh, you get, you train such a neural network, you get out an algorithm that, that does that, that makes boxes around images, but we have no way of telling anyone what the probability is that it's going to work. The only thing that we can do is we can collect even more data than the data that we used for, for making this training happen, and then we just run it. On, on that data, and then we can look, so if I have a thousand data samples or 10,000 data samples, of course I can calculate, oh, it was a thousand times I did it, and 999 times it was good, and one time it was bad, but this is not a mathematical answer, because it depends on the data you chose. And then we get all these questions about, oh no, the sun comes from a slightly different, you know, and so on. So there is no way that I, as a mathematician, can tell you, yes, I promise you that it's going to work, that often, there's no way. Like, and there's all these questions like biases, when you talk about medicine, for instance, you know, you take, I don't know, you take samples always from like white people and then you cannot apply it in Asia, for instance, you know, depending on what the health issue is and so on. So 
Uh, yeah, so I think that's what it needs to, to understand. Um, I don't know what people want to answer the other questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the, the first question: uh, What is intelligence and artificial intelligence? I mean, that's a. I, I really don't have a good answer for that. I think the issue is that we don't know what. In, I mean, we can't define these concepts at all. Uh, yeah, they do, but you know, it's a. It is a research field, but it, there is no consensus what intelligence is, and I don't think that artificial intelligence will be the same as intelligence. Uh, that's one thing. It's like uh, if you think about how um, when we make machi machines to do things that, that humans can do, they don't do it in the same way that humans do it. If you want to make a machine that flies, you're not going to make it work like a bird. You, know, you make an airplane, which is completely different. Um, so it's just that I think that what we uh, will perceive as artificial intelligence will be something completely different from what we uh, perceive as intelligence. So, that, yeah. You know what? No, I um, agree. I think the I think your first question and your third question were more alike than I than I anticipated, because I I also d agree that it's not artificial intelligence should not be classified as human intelligence, and in my presentation I said that we my belief is that we should work to see different intelligences and collaborate with them, human and non-human. And I, I, I'm really inspired by this um, technologist and uh, artist who's an indigenous uh, artist and maker from Hawaii, and where he talks about how we as people need to learn how to take care of these intelligences. And by taking care, it can be anything from what I do at work is with my data science colleagues, maintain the data sets, make sure that it's trained on data that is ethical, um, to also legally and governments, like how do we take care of what it does and what it doesn't do? Um, and this, uh, this artist, Jason Edward Lewis, I, I really recommend everyone to read him, says that indigenous people have been uh, the closest, the best at stewarding the land, taking care of the land and different nature and animals. So they also should take care of artificial intelligence as well. And this is something that is a provocation, I think. Um, so how do we as humans also see non-human intelligences as something that we need to take care of and have responsibility for? Um, so this is something I kind of want to push back, that we can't think of it as something to look down on, um, but we have to sort of start negotiating what these relationships look like. And um, I definitely want to point to our... Um, politician here, <laughs> because this is something that I, uh, I'm so happy you're on this panel with us. <laughs> of course, until it starts looking down on us. <laughs> Do you feel we answered your third question? Well, okay, I'm, I, I, I asked the questions for the discussions, of course. I think that um, your answer to, to explaining Say okay, we need to mathematically define it. Means that we never, we will never understand human intelligence. We will just never do it. Uh, and then the question is, do we accept the level to which we can understand human intelligence or trust human intelligence, uh, or do we require machines to be more trustable than human intelligence? I think that's kind of where I was going with this. Uh, because we, we we sort of can delve and dig and say, okay, so can we really define everything? And I don't think we can, but thank you. More questions? Yep, can you make that toss? Uh, or maybe I pass think, it? For the, for the sake of saying, yeah. Yes. Hey, hello, so uh, I have a question. I read the other day that the new GPT would think would be one trillion parameters like the parameters we saw in the diagrams and and so there's a huge problem with the size and it would take hundred million dollars to, to train it take weeks and so on so so size is a huge problem uh, from what I understand but then I, you point it was a nice uh, comment you said you we need three pictures of a cat to a kid to, to show it's a cat to teach it it's a cat are we missing some could there be some mathematical idea or some really smart thing that would completely change the game and make uh, yeah change the game with the size question. Thank you. 
I think this is like a million dollar question. This is also a big field in this theory of machine learning um, to, to, to exactly understand uh, what we can do if we do not have a lot of data available. It's of course also a very relevant question because uh, in many scenarios we might not have millions of data. I mean, I can Google a cat and get a lot of cat pictures, but for instance, for a specific type of disease or something, which I want to be able to recognize if someone has it, I maybe do not have a million data samples. I just do not have it, right? And so then we would want to have these systems. So I think it's possible that we can have something, but I don't think we have anything at the moment. Like this sort of neural network technology is only really working well on this big data, I think. Right. Sure, I can add something. Um, so this is sort of contrarian to that, rather. Um, so th there is some research that shows essentially that the easier the system is to learn, the more unstable it becomes. And that sort of instability and easy to learn is some, goes hand in hand. So it's, uh, it, and if, if it's easy to, uh, to teach, it's also easy to fool, which is probably not very good. Um, but yeah, so I think that's um, to find something that works, I don't know how it would work, but maybe, yeah. Sorry? It would have to be different. But I think also if you take a, a kid looking at a cat, if they see the cat, they actually have many images of that cat. You know, it's not gonna be like a, you know, a micro second snapshot from one angle of the cat. It's probably gonna be you know, interacting a little bit with the cat maybe, or you know, the cat walks around, so you, you, you get to see, you know, there's a lot more information than just one image of a cat, I think. But I don't know. I think it's, it's also, they also have like a pre-learned uh, conception of the 3D world, and they sort of extrapolate from that as well. So there's like, you know, there's a lot of baggage that they already learned themselves by interacting in the world when they first see the cat, figure out what it is, I guess. But uh, yeah. More questions? Um, you were first and then you were next. Um, hi, yeah, um, I run a small AI startup and it's more a humble thought right now than an actual question. But um, when you were talking about AI stewardship, um, that really made me think and connect to the uh, question before about intelligence and artificial intelligence. Namely, it's the fact about governance and ethics. So we, as an AI-based startup, we work with team dynamics. And sometimes the most intelligent when we look at a team is like, okay, this team member has to go, but that's not the most eth and most ethical thing to do. We have to like find a way that the AI tells the team, okay, this is how you can make it work. So in regard to that, and especially to Adrian, a lot of startups and AI based startups that I know in businesses, they already do self-governance. They already try to have their own ethical inhibitors built into the AIs and neural networks. And if you want to find a good policy making, it's always the best to go to the, the roots and have a dialogue with the people who already try to imply self-governance, I think. So, yeah, if you ever need a lead there, <laughs> holler. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, well, I, I think, of course, I think self-governance is good. Uh, but I am of the view that politics need to get more involved, that we need regulation. Uh, I don't think it is enough to leave it. I'm, I'm not saying that you said that, but I don't think it is enough to leave this in the hand of the market, I have to say. But of course, it's, it, it needs to be done in close dialogue with, with uh, the businesses and, and other, other actors uh, on this arena, of course. But uh, it's good to know that you exist. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Magnus Nordstrom. I'm, I'm a, um, a diplomat and well, I write currently a trade union leader, one of the SACO trade unions. And uh, I've been dealing somewhat with, with this issue um, uh, in the Council of Europe. Um, but I, but I, I, I have one question because I, what, I, what I believe is that, you know, we're all in human relations. We try to understand each other. We're all black boxes in a sense. Uh, and then, but, but we are quite slow. I mean, our communication, that's, that's the coordination. And the scary thing, I would say, that people, it's the capacity that you, you, could, you can scale it up to a global level. Uh, and, and that means that you'll have to be, I think, careful of what you actually intend to use it for. 
but the uncertainty of it, I mean, you will always have a certain, like in life, a certain amount of uncertainty anyway, um, when it comes to, you know, the, the effect of what you do. I mean, you can't be 100% sure. And maybe we'll have to live with that. I mean, it's just, just a statement that, that, that in a philosophical sense that, yes, we, we can regulate, we can on a principle regulate, but we'll have to expect that there will be problems, there will be certain amount of discrimination sometimes and and actually as as in life we'll have just have to be very good at rectifying that problem and be very very quick in in in, in changing that outcome that was just a, uh, not much of a question more of a, a statement i think it's a very very good comment that i think affects everyone here like you no know, doesn't matter in what area of ai you work with or not work with it i think this is a very important aspect that we I think we might want to ex uh, accept the artificial intelligence and it has a certain uncertainty, uh, but then from the regulation aspect uh, and me being like the, the mathematician here together with Benny, I just want to maybe advocate that sometimes I feel that people are using AI too quickly. Like this, I have seen two instances which were both in the medical context, okay, I'm just going to give you one of them as an example was a medical well-known company, I'm not going to say the name of course, and they invited me to come as a consultant because they wanted to show some product for some new 3D MRI type of scan and what to do with it. And I went there, and so what was essentially happening is that they had, uh, every time they took a scan, it had some funny features on the, the picture that would like, you know, it's like as if you would have a picture and you put an overlay on top of it and they just wanted to get rid of it. And what their current thing was that they have been doing is that they have just used machine learning. But that I think is horribly wrong because since the 70s, before we even had good computers, we have algorithms that are classically, mathematically proven stable algorithms that can like take out something from pictures and don't have these features anymore. So we have algorithms, they work. They are also less computationally expensive but they have been using machine learning just because every time someone feels they have a problem at the moment, oh, why don't we just machine learn it? And I just think this is not good, you know? When I'm not opposed to machine learning. I think it's good to have a certain uncertainty, but if there is alternative technologies where we have understanding that this is a mathematical robust thing, I think we should try to use it. Definitely when it comes to medical issues, you know, and so that I have two such examples, and yeah, that was much it. I think this is also maybe an interesting political <laughs> aspect that if there is alternative technologies which are stable, then maybe one should advocate using them. It just occurs to me while like while we're talking and then audience is talking that this like instability of it all kind of like keeps coming through. Um, and like the medical field, like I guess like I think abuse <laughs> of, of technology is a really poignant example. Um, even the day before I was coming here, talking about real people with jobs, right? Uh, a, a friend of, who's a copywriter was getting some really weird texts uh, to edit. Um, this was about three and a half months ago. And um, she was, you know, noticing that something was very strange with the text. Um, but now, actually, quite rapidly, as soon as she got those weird texts, a few weeks later, she's been out of a job for the first time in five years. And so I think this is something, this instability of the machine, but also this instability of people, you know, using the, uh, the AI or technologies and our instability and our precarity in the system of it all is something to kind of really, really, like, think about from all sides, um, that the instability is in everything. And... Um, like what, what protection is there for her, right, um, to move forward. And um, I guess this is something I, I was thinking about when she told me, and I told her I was going to a panel on AI to speak at, um, that maybe we don't feel that right now, um, especially like in research and in tech, um, but we will, and maybe some of us in this room have already felt it. Um, we're talking about it right now. So yeah, I just wanted to pull that thread out for everyone because it's, it's, it's um, something that's coming up for me. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to, uh, I guess we can take our last two questions. Uh, my name is Penny Klein. Uh, I'm 
like to go back to the question that was in the, the invitation to the seminar, and that is, what do we need to know about AI? Or, you know, is it a problem that we don't understand AI? So it would be really interesting to hear just, you know, if, if uh, me as a citizen, not, you know, working particularly with AI, but what do I need to know? Or what do I need to know? We have a policymaker here. What does he need to know about AI? Thank you. Wonderful question. I will give the microphone to Adrian in a second. I, I think as a citizen, you don't have to, I, I mean, it's not your job to do the research and try to understand it. I mean, there are some people like Benny and I who try to do this. I think it's just good to be aware. It's just good to be aware of that. This is not the same thing as other functions that your computer or your smartphone is doing in the sense that we just do not have a good theory to back it up with. It's just good to be aware of it. Okay, but I think that's, that's, that's it, I think, what you have to do. But uh, the politics, I think, should also be aware of it when making decisions. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> I don't know what more to say. Uh, <laughs> well, but, no, I agree. I, I don't think citizens and politicians need to know, like, every technical detail. It's, I mean, it's, it's no other uh, political subject that you need to know everything about. I mean, you don't need to be an expert on every issue. You need to know what, to, what it is and what to do with it. But... I think that the knowledge about AI could be could be furthered among uh, the citizens among citizens in Sweden, and I think uh, I mean we have been good at that before. We made uh, in Sweden we call it hem PC uh, reform in the 90s, where where it was very easy to buy a, a personal computer, and and I mean we managed to make people who worked in the 80s and the 70s to nowadays be sitting at a computer all day. I mean we are quite adaptable, I think. I, need, I think we as politicians need to start thinking about that next reform. And possibly AI is something that we could be, could be using in that uh, to, to strengthen the citizens' knowledge of AI. Something like the HEMPC reform. You don't know what that is. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, I think that is something we, we need to look at uh, as politicians. Okay. Yeah, sure. yeah, so maybe i'm uh, sound like an alarmist here but uh, one, one thing i think <laughs> is good to do as a citizen yes is to reduce the uh, the data construction so whenever you interact on the internet so you interact in apps you interact with all these things especially if you have an account you're constructing data that they can use to you know manipulate you through for ads right to buy stuff that's the mo least sinister thing I could come up with. But, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, you know, one thing to be mindful of is that uh, you're giving away, you know, valuable information to these, these companies that uh, provide you with a service for free in, in, sort of in return for this. You know, uh, this is just, you know, my skepticism of, the, of, the, of it all, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it actually happens. So that's... Uh, <laughs> I just want to like say that for me, like going back to my ethos that I said earlier, was that I really do believe that we all have a hand in building technology. Um, regulating it's different, you know. I don't want to um, make, I don't want to flatten what regulation uh, is versus us building it and creating something. Um, I come at it from a designerly side. I work in tech and I work in education, um, and I work uh, within design education, um, and very often. Uh, Designers are always thought that we're just visual, but we actually are very much like involved with the coding and the technology building as well. Um, and as soon as we start understanding what's going on in the back end, the back systems, then our um, our presence is taken more seriously. And I, I and I wonder what that would be like if all of our citizen, uh, us as citizens in this world, uh, took a little bit of a deeper interest in the technologies um, that we're using, especially with AI, and we kind of use that as knowledge uh, to then also have our voice taken more seriously um, with these things. And so I really don't, I think the, a really nice like a uh, like concrete example is to think about your data and what you uh, consume <laughs> and what you give out, maybe without knowing, um, but also just um, really staying up to date of it, about this and critically thinking about like what it is that these technologies are being used for. Um, so, you yeah. know. Okay, we're already kind of over time, but if your question is very quick, then. 
Okay, then maybe not a question. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, throw out like w w what a reflection was. Um, it, it was that if you, a couple of things that you said and you said that that I really picked up on, and it was this like this uncertainty, this um, uh, not uh, instability, uh, and I mean almost this like this this uh, a couple of you said this things around like. The, the, looking at risk and like looking at this for sort of a almost a pessimistic way of like there's this this dangerous thing that's about to come to us and 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 I'm really wanting to think of like also what is the the opportunities for seeing this as the, the this really powerful thing that could move us into this like amazing future you know because I mean kind of like you said of you know we need to like not look down on this thing but it's like but are we just one step in the evolution of consciousness? And is is this really the next thing? So, yeah, I, I think just the the idea of my reflection was, you know, how to be optimistic. So maybe that's a good place to wrap it up and have each of our panelists um, very briefly say, what are your vision, dream, goal with AI in your particular connection to it? Okay, I'll start. Um, I would like uh, us to move away, us as humans, to move away from uh, work that is maybe could be automated, uh, that we do think uh, creatively and start supporting each other more, um, all minorities, and start engaging more actively with our world. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I don't know. I, I think um, <clears throat> on a more sort of a local to me kind of thing. Uh, I mean, more research is needed and I think uh, more, somehow my uh, vision would be that more mathematicians would be interested in doing AI research because I find it very important that we understand these things. And uh, as you, I mean, as uh, Kathleen said, you know, we cannot read old papers because there's so much things being produced every day. Um, and, you know, we cannot you know, solve these problems alone. So we need, you know, more people, more resources. So that's, uh, you know, my, my plug, I guess. <laughs> so we need more, like, uh, investment in funding PhD positions <laughs> in AI research. So we need the <coughs> scale up the already existing VASP program, the Wallenberg program. Which is actually pretty substantial if you think of a little country as Sweden. But yes, yes, I 100% agree with everything that has been said so far. And to maybe tie into your thing, I think also this mathematical research that's trying to understand the system will also help this optimism. Because if we understand it better, we can also make it better. And I mean, at the moment, we do lots of trial and error. And I mean, people hire lots of PhD students or companies hire lots of people that tweak parameters. And then, oh, someone has a great idea and something great happens, but we still don't understand it. But if we understand it, then maybe we can actually make the AI world a better place. Yeah, I, I'm hoping that AI can be used to make a better society, build a better society. That's pretty easy. <laughs> I mean, that's that's. if it's not that, then we shouldn't have it. <laughs> I mean. If we if it's bad for us, then we should we shouldn't develop it. But I don't think it is. I'm optimistic about it. But but I hope that we can use it to make uh, work environments better for workers and uh, hopefully uh, solving. It's not the only way, but solving the climate crisis, those kind of things. But uh, we'll see how it all plays out. Okay. So thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to you wonderful audience. Yeah.